Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the content patch for the 9th of January 2014. My name is Total Biscuit with today's gaming news and comment. Coming up in the show, Titanfall will be capped at 12 players, Razer unveils its modular PC concept, and Sony announces PlayStation Now. All this Neo Zero Remix track of the day is coming your way right about Gaike. Respawn has confirmed that its forthcoming FPS Titanfall, which will be released on the Xbox 360, Xbox One, and the PC, will be set to a maximum player count of 6 versus 6, that being 12 players in total. The game, however, will feature what they're calling AI support, which, by the sounds of it, will be something along the lines of creeps or minions in a MOBA game. Weaker AI soldiers that will join the battle alongside and versus player characters and titans that are significantly stronger than them. The producer of the game talking to Polygon stated that it wasn't really a technical question for them and that they tested dozens and dozens of players. It's more of a creative and game design decision. Now, I was actually quite surprised that so many people were disappointed by this. In fact, the responses on Twitter went something along these lines. Very disappointed, Vince. That sounds incredibly lousy. Welp, glad I didn't pre-order. This is supposed to be a next-gen title. There is no other next-gen title where the maximum is 6 versus 6. How about removing all the AI and increasing the player count? And forums such as NeoGAF and Reddit have followed up with fairly similar sentiments, stating that the number is disappointing. Here's the thing. I... Comparing Titanfall to other games doesn't seem reasonable. Until you play Titanfall and see exactly what Titanfall is trying to accomplish on its own, it makes very little sense to judge the game based on its play account. That's like saying, oh well, in League of Legends I can only play 5v5, that's really disappointing. Or in Dota 2 I can only play 5v5. The game is balanced for that. Yeah? If you go higher than that, it actually adversely affects the game experience. And even stuff like Counter-Strike, it is played best in 5 versus 5 formats. Yes, you can play 12v12 and things like that, but it's a pretty bad format, all things considered. There's a reason why the competitive format is 5v5. And even in something like StarCraft, the competitive format is 1v1. And you might think, oh, that sounds really disappointing. I want to play 4v4. You can do that, absolutely, but it's worse. Like, it's not balanced that way. Games are designed to be played in a very specific way. They're play-tested and honed to this particular point where they have to be very specific about the number of players. And I think it's further complicated when you add AI elements in there, because my understanding of this is that these AI elements are not just the same as you. They're not clones of players that just act with AI. They're weaker troops. They're creeps. They're minions. Now you're throwing a few Dota elements in there. You can't simply say, well, get rid of those and just add more players because that completely screws up the balance. One assumes that killing these characters will be integral to you actually earning your Titan in the first place and there'll be that interesting asymmetrical aspect. In fact, it'll be a three-tiered asymmetrical aspect of the war. You've got your AI troops that are the weakest and they're kind of cannon fodder, but they're the most numerous. You've then got your guys with the jetpacks, as in you, you know, the, the standard player with the jetpacks and the flexibility. You're a bit tougher. You've got a lot more firepower. And then you've got the Titans above that. It's similar to saying, well, why don't you just let everyone be in a Titan? Because that would be boring. That's, that's the problem. The idea is that a Titan is kind of like a tank in something like Battlefield 4. You shouldn't let everyone get in a tank because it ends up being dull. This is something that I personally am quite passionate about because I used to play the original Planet side. And back then, a lot of people didn't get the idea of combined arms. They almost still don't. Complaining, oh, well, a tank kills me on foot. It's supposed to kill you on foot. The point is you're supposed to limit the number of tanks. In Planet Side 1, they did that pretty effectively. In Planet Side 2, maybe not so much. There are a lot of tanks in that game, not to mention the fact that you can drive a tank and shoot with one, as opposed to Planet Side 1, where you actually could not do that outside of the little one-man paper lightning tanks. But the point is that combined arms warfare and certain asymmetry makes games more interesting. And that's the point of a game like Titanfall as well. You're not supposed to all be in Titans, because then that's just a bad mech warrior. Why would you want to do that? If they honestly believe that 6 versus 6 is the balanced approach, then so be it. Now, the hope is that on PC, eventually, you'll be able to mod it. Now, they're stating that they're looking at the viability of releasing modding tools after launch. They're not going to do it at launch. At least they're aware of that possibility. And the hope is that they don't lock the entire game down. And perhaps at that point, there may be a mode whereby there's more players and things end up working out. And it's not like the developer's always 100% right, but right now they're 
really holding all the cards. They've got all the information about this game, whereas all we've done is managed to play it at a show for 15 minutes. I know it's personal preference, and it's also the personal preference of people that are complaining about the fact that this doesn't have larger teams, and their opinion obviously has merit just as much as mine does. But over the last couple of years, outside of something massive like, say, Planetside, I've really been veering towards the idea of smaller teams and more individual worth on a player-by-player -player basis, to the point where I only play Rush in Battlefield. I even started playing some of the smaller squad modes because I enjoyed that more than this big 64-player battle. And I know the spectacle of Battlefield at 64 players or the spectacle of something like Planetside with hundreds of people in the same area. That's really, really awesome. But at that point, you really are just that little cog in the machine and you have to accept that you will die for ridiculous reasons. You get out there and suddenly you have a bomb dropped on you by a liberator and you instantly die. And it's like, well, I couldn't have done anything about that, really. Or you just eat a stray tank shell. You can't kill the tank on your own. You've got to get other people together for that. And there's definite value in that. And that's why I think Combined Arms works really well. But that also applies to something like Titanfall. Except with a smaller team size, there's more agency agency on each player. There's more importance placed on each player. And I actually value that an awful lot. It's why I enjoy the 5 versus 5 format for Counter-Strike. It's why it's a viable competitive format. It's why, to some degree, I, of course, still enjoy Dota-style games. Because, really, it does put agency on each player. With FPS, I have veered away from playing with larger teams into formats with either smaller teams or lone wolf stuff because I just prefer being able to provide value on my own and not having to rely on other people. From what I can tell with a small format like this, it seems like if you are skilled enough, you can take on anything, including a Titan. And to me, that's actually really interesting. That is something that I am actively looking for in video games at this time. I understand that some other people aren't, but I've got to say, having smaller teams does not make the game bad. And I don't think there's any proof that it would be. If people were expecting Battlefield with mechs, then it looks like they're going to be disappointed. But I didn't want Battlefield with mechs. We already had that game. Bigger doesn't always mean better when it comes to things like team size. When a game's designed around large-scale combined arms warfare, then you can say, oh, yeah, it's pretty terrible that it only has, say, 16 on 16 or 8 on 8. But there's really nothing suggesting that Titanfall was ever designed that way. So I'm looking forward to smaller size teams personally, as long as it is actually, as they're saying, very much a balance and game design decision as opposed to a technical reason. More power to them. Absolutely. Bring it on. With all of the talk of the Steam machines at CES 2014, it might be easy to ignore Project Christine from Razer, the world's most modular PC design, as they are personally calling it. It appears to be a giant stack of modules, each of these modules with a different function that can all be plugged into a centralized tower with active water cooling and heat exchangers in each module, which are connected to a central active water cooling system, which circulates within the central tower itself. The power supply is located at the bottom along with the cooling and various components such as the CPU, memory, motherboard and GPU are split off and separated into separate modules which can be exchanged at will. The concept also features a front mount display telling you exactly what's going on with it, presumably with some touchscreen functionality although that has not been extrapolated upon. Currently, this machine was built only as a prototype and a concept. However, Razer are calling it their vision for the future of PC gaming. Now, to me, i got to say this is a hell of a lot more interesting than the current batch of Steam machines. The Steam brand could certainly push PC gaming forward, but this whole modular design thing is where I honestly see PC gaming going eventually. As to when, that's a different matter. The technical challenges that have to be met in order to actually make this thing work are numerous, including the notion that they're saying you can swap stuff out on the fly, including CPUs. That's quite surprising considering that Windows requires reinstallation in order to run on different chipsets. You can't just swap out a chipset and then expect your Windows to actually work. It doesn't. There are certain workarounds, and if you use the same chipset, you've got a better chance of success, but reliably doing that? Well, that's a different matter entirely. So that's one technical challenge. The second one being, can you adequately cool all of the components? The active cooling system sounds 
actually quite fantastic when you think about it. The idea of having this pre-installed system that will allow you to cool a variety of different components with these so-called leakless connectors without having to fiddle around with it and maintain it, that sounds amazing in theory, but these closed loop systems already exist and they're not necessarily as good as a bigger custom job when it comes to water cooling. I personally run a closed loop system on my CPU, the Corsair H100, and it's okay, but I know I could get way, way better performance out of something else. More to the point, we're talking about cooling multiple components. Lots of them, in fact. We're even talking about cooling hard drives with this thing, because the hard drives will be inside closed modules, meaning there's no actual airflow. So you need an active cooling system that is powerful enough to cool a CPU, the memory, several storage devices, as well as multiple GPUs. Now that in itself is a challenge, especially if you want to keep the thing quiet. If they manage to pull that off, that will be phenomenal. They're even claiming that this thing is actually quite silent. For me, that would be amazing. Having something with that level of power and also that level of cooling without the decibels, that's great for recording. But I'm not convinced that that can really be achieved with a closed loop like that. And I have to wonder how many components you can add into the mix before it overloads the cooling system. You surely can't just keep adding on GPU modules and expect the cooling to keep up. It's still the same cooling system, you're just cooling more stuff with it. The next and perhaps most obvious problem that I see with it is the idea of buying components. Who are you buying them from? These modules appear to be very much proprietary to Razer, so if they have a closed loop cooling system within them, is it possible to swap components out of those modules yourself? And if it is, doesn't that also then completely defeat the point of the exercise? The idea of it being modular is that you can just buy the component, slot it in and go. But who are you buying it from? Will Razer be in control of curating that kind of stuff? Will they only have certain components available on sale? Will there be a markup beyond simply the cost of the module? Will it then just become ludicrously expensive? It's difficult to say. Razer makes some peripheral hardware, but they don't make CPUs, they don't make GPUs, and they most likely never will. So it worries me at that point just how much this thing would end up costing, whether it would eliminate the actual benefit of being modular by just costing so damn much that you might as well just buy a bespoke PC, something from a boutique computer builder. And you, yeah, you're gonna pay more for that, but if you're gonna end up paying more for the modules over the long run, then... Again, why would you really bother with that? I really like the concept. I mean, I love the idea of it. It looks incredible. Don't get me wrong. Aesthetically, it's absolutely gorgeous. The cooling solution sounds phenomenal, although I'm not entirely sure that they can really make it work. If they manage to pull it off, it will be great, but I would expect it to be costly. That said, I feel the concept is the future eventually. I don't know when and I don't know in what form, but it's very interesting to see a company go out of its way to actively build something like that and make the bloody thing work. And finally, Sony has, quote, announced PlayStation Now, which is actually just Gaike, the thing that they spoke about last year, the cloud gaming technology, which would allow previous generation games to be played, quote unquote, on the PlayStation 4. This actually involves streaming it from a cloud server with the idea that the technology has got to the point where lag will not be a factor they hope. Instead of calling it Gaike, which is the company that they acquired, they've decided to call it PlayStation Now, and they have announced that it will be supporting various platforms, including, of course, the PlayStation 4, PlayStation 3, PS Vita, as well as televisions, tablets, and smartphones, which is perhaps a little bit of a surprise to some people, considering that in theory, some of those tablets and smartphones would not be made by Sony. The implication previously was that the Gaike technology would be used exclusively on Sony platforms, but it turns out that will actually not be the case. They've not spoken as to which tablets and smartphones will support this, however they have said that 2014 US models of Sony Bravia televisions will support it, and one has to assume that they will be focusing on Bravia TVs and are unlikely to roll out the service to other platforms. The closed beta for the service in the US will begin next month, and they are not ready to confirm launch plans for PAL territories at this time. Now, I've got to say, this thing has got a little bit weird with the addition of tablets and smartphones. I understand running Sony stuff on Sony platforms. Absolutely. That makes sense. You run the PlayStation games on your PlayStation hardware of some description. 
but things get really strange when you add tablets and smartphones into the mix because really you've got to support iPad and you've got to support Android there. It would be extremely difficult and perhaps counterproductive to release the application only on Sony phones, like say the Sony Xperia Play. And when it comes to tablets, Sony has even less penetration there. So to me, unless you had to somehow tether your smartphone or tablet to a Sony device, you're basically saying it's okay for you to play Sony games, PlayStation games on a non-PlayStation platform. That to me is very, very odd. Not to mention the fact that at no point did they ever mention PC, which could absolutely do this. So would it be okay to allow PlayStation games to be played on an iPad, but not on a PC? Where's the sense of that, I suppose? If you're going to allow non-Sony products to actually run this thing, then surely you should allow all non-Sony products to run this thing. So that's what I want to know. Will it require some form of tethering, or can I quite literally not own a Sony device, use my iPad to subscribe to PlayStation Now, and play PS3 games on my tablet? Can I do that? And don't get me wrong, that's really, really cool. It just sounds a bit strange. It's very different to the business model that we've seen from an awful lot of console manufacturers, i.e. pretty much all of them over the last couple of decades. You, you don't give your property to another platform. That's the point. You want to sell as many units as you can. And Gaike initially was put out there as a selling point for the PlayStation 4 platform and, of course, the PlayStation Vita as well. Admittedly, it was more of a band-aid for the real problem that that machine has in that it doesn't have any backwards compatibility. So they're looking to sell you the same games again, or in this case, actually give you a subscription. One assumes that PlayStation Plus will be involved in this as well. And I would happily subscribe to a service like that. That sounds fantastic if it had a good enough library of games for me to actually choose from. But it is definitely no replacement for backwards compatibility, especially if you already own a lot of games on the PlayStation 3. What I'd like to know is if the games that I bought on the PS3 digitally would be available to me via PlayStation Now on the PlayStation 4 and the Vita and the TV and the tablet, or would I have to either rent them again or buy them again? That's a good question. I can understand them not giving you access to physical copies. That would be an absolute nightmare. And how the hell do you even prove that you own them in the first place? But for digital, when they have that on record, it seems like giving you access to them would be the right thing to do. But who the hell knows if they're even going to do that? There's really been no announcement as to that whatsoever. And then you've got the whole tablet situation. So... I don't know if I really want to play too many games in the cloud. I don't think it would make too much of a difference visually to play a PlayStation 3 game from the cloud or play, of course, on PlayStation Vita or a tablet which has a smaller screen, so it's more difficult to notice the artifacting and perhaps the latency. But I don't think I'd go out of my way to stream PlayStation 3 games onto my PlayStation 4. I think it makes more sense just to hang on to my PlayStation 3. So I'm tentatively interested in it, but I really want to know what exactly they're going to be doing with phones and tablets. And if they're going to put it on iPad and they're going to put it on Android devices, then how soon would it be before someone manages to figure out how to get the thing running on PC and whether or not that would even be a problem for Sony? All right, folks, that wraps me up. So thank you very much for watching the content patch. Before I go, I'd like to give you the OC Remix track of the day. Something fairly recent here from Sir Nuts, which is a remix of the uh, rather iconic Bionic Commando theme. In this case, the remix is very much a trance take on the original track, which I actually enjoy quite a bit. Enjoy Sir Nuts' take on a Bionic Commando from 1988, and this is featured on the free album Bionic Commando Remix, OK Wheel Groove, which is available for free download over on ocremix.org. Thank you very much for watching, folks, and I will see you next time.